Now we're going to open the debate. Uh, Prime Minister Ratas unfortunately had to leave. He had announced that beforehand. Uh, yes. Moving on up. This is cozy. Um, so I'm uh, I'm going to uh, to open the debate. I would like to to focus the debate uh, on not on the question how do we regulate technology, but how do we liberals, liberals and democrats, uh, make sure that our liberal values are upheld in the digital era. I think that is the that's the key issue. We tend to get distracted by all the technological uh, developments, but technology will take its course. You know, we we don't need, we don't need to regulate that. We at, at best we need to facilitate it. But how do we uphold our liberal values? How do we uh, protect? civil liberties, fundamental freedoms? How do we protect the individual? How do we empower the individual? How do we make sure that the emancipation that was, uh, let's say, triggered by the uh, in the industrial era, that that is not undone, but actually strengthened? How do we strengthen democracy? Uh, I mentioned transparency, accountability. How do we make sure that we don't weaken checks and balances? but that we strengthen them? How do we make sure that we know where the powers lie, where decisions are being taken? And of course, also in economic terms, our, our liberal values are indeed competition, opportunity, enterprise, uh, development. How do, we, how do we make sure that all, the, all those liberal core values are upheld and that we don't get sidetracked or distracted and make the wrong choices uh, as liberals. That's the, the, those are the questions I would like to put. I'm going to first uh, ask the members of the panel to, to very briefly respond to those questions and the interventions uh, of the other panelists and speakers, uh, and then I'm going to, uh, to turn to the, the audience. So maybe, uh, Vera, you would like to, yes. to intervene first, yes? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, this is very wide uh, question or a series of questions uh, which uh, I like because they are not uh, focused on technologies but on people and this is very important. Well, I think how to do all these things. First of all, I fully agree that uh, the role of liberals is to defend the rights and the position and space for individual and it, his or her freedom. And uh, what we see now uh, the clear shift uh, of the showing that the big ones are becoming bigger and the small ones are becoming smaller. And uh, I don't want to start some, uh, some criticism of the big giants who are all Americans. And believe me, it was nice to hear you praising the <laughs> European rules <laughs> for the American companies. But uh, we, we need to make sure that the individuals are empowered. And this is exactly what we are doing through the general data protection uh, regulation, because here the, uh, is the approach that uh, it is not for the crowd. It is for the individuals who, has, who have to give consent for processing their data and who have to participate more in decision making what will happen with their privacy and with their own identity. I think that it will need a lot of enlightenment and education. But the people have to uh, be given this clear information, the protection of your privacy is, in your, is back in your hands. So this is the first thing, GDPR, and, and uh, we have uh, had a lot of uh, work in, in explaining to people what it means. The second thing, to, to cooperate uh, seriously and with full responsibility with IT sector, because the frustration of the, uh, sorry to say it, but of the small ones, of the individuals, is that also that they uh, ask the politicians for something they cannot deliver anymore. Because a lot of power shifted to this digital sphere. And when I was in Silicon Valley in September, I spoke to the managers of all the big ones, and they said, well, we are asked from Europe to take down the websites of Catalonia. Are we those who should decide on it? make sure you, you tidy up in Europe. It, it was very strange to hear that. Uh, or one, one manager to, uh, said that one, one uh, morning I woke up and I decided to take down the, the neo-Nazi websites. And then he was accused for making arbitrary decision. 
And he said, well, I, I did it because I, I thought it is the right thing to do. But he, he said, I don't feel comfortable uh, to have to do such decisions. It should be the politicians to set the rules. So what we see now, or what I, what I understand, they took too much power and they want to give it back to us now. <laughs> and uh, we have to take it and we have to keep the dialogue with the IT to push them to take their social responsibility, but also to comply with the rules. Because hate speech, calling for radicalization, terrorism, uh, all of these things are prohibited by laws. Prohibited to protect individuals, to come back to your question. But we are in a serious moment now. We must make sure that it's not only prohibited, it, it will be clearly declared by, by all the society, including the IT sector, that it is unacceptable. And I think that this is the right liberal approach, that we, we will call for cooperation on, on this uh, wide societal consensus about <coughs> what's unacceptable in Europe, uh, which is endangering the individuals. Last thing, uh, why to empower individuals? Well, you know, I come from the post-totalitarian country. I'm very nervous about this, that we simply come to the era when we see how easy it is to manage crowd. We see in IT sphere, in, in, in Internet, managed, fantastically managed crowd management. Uh, the people are influenced in, in millions. And we need to empower the individuals, not to be the blind, sorry to say it's stupid, pieces of this crowd. We need the people to understand what's, the, what's happening. Uh, so this is important. The last uh, thing which I, I forgot to say in my speech, uh, in Europe now, uh, we have to drink a very untasteful untasty cocktail, and that's the American technology being uh, uh, used by Russian propaganda. And I'm sure we have to be stronger in, in our response against this. And again, we have to have people on our side, whatever we are going to do, not people in the sense of unlimited crowd, but individuals who will be empowered and who will understand what's happening and who will understand that if they cooperate, we will be able together to keep democracy in the EU. Thank you very much. Um, David essentially said we need regulation. Yes, I think <laughs> that deserves a hand. Uh, and, and Luther said we need more competition. Uh, we need both. Can you reflect a little bit on the, the questions uh, that were put? Well, I, I was taken by your comments, Commissioner, about the need to uh, empower the individual. Uh, but Sophie, you sort of indicated it was about that rather than about laws. Uh, and I, I just think those two things aren't mutually incompatible at all. Uh, I reflect on this from our industry. That's what my speech was about from our perspective. You know, television's been around for a little more than 90 years. And right from the word go, it was understand what a powerful medium it was for shaping society mm -hmm. and for influ influencing individuals and for the way that they lived their lives. And right from the word go, politicians realized they needed to have a legal framework which ensured that the individual was empowered and understood and that their rights were protected and that society's values were upheld. And now we're in a situation in television where, you know, in most markets, there is a well-understood, well-respected body of law that we all comply with. In the UK, there's 400 pages of our Communications Act, which governs what we do. Uh, in Europe, there are about a dozen regulations and directives. In Germany, I deal with 16 regulators, which is not fun, I can promise you, uh, but worthwhile. Uh, and I think the point I'm trying to make is it's recognized that we were a, a powerful industry with the ability to shape society and therefore should be subject to a, a framework. But the internet actors are now way more powerful than we have ever been and influencing the individuals and society way more than we ever can. And our 
content and their content is sort of sitting side by side, and our customers can't tell the difference. They don't know what's subject to the rules and what isn't. And I would say, so that's the kind of the first takeaway, that actually, you know, you've got powerful actors out there in the, in the, in the sectors that are understood to be uh, influential on our society, one of which is regulated and one of which is not really subject to rules at all in the same way. And then the second point I would make is, I think, I think we're really important contributors to free speech, to democracy, to freedom. I think, you know, television news, for example, is really important for disseminating ideas, documentaries and all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, and I don't feel that the, rate, the rules that we follow constrain that free speech. They don't constrain our liberties. They provide a sensible framework that politicians mm. have decided is right. If it's sensible. If it's sensible. <laughs> and I, I, I would just, I challenge the idea, the notion that you can't apply a similar kind of thinking to what happens online. I'm not saying it's easy, but it should be possible. And it isn't, it is, does not about, it's not about challenging our freedoms, it's not about challenging our democracy. Uh, it's not about censorship. It's about a framework that understands how important this is to our society and to individuals interacting with them. Yeah, first, to, to eliminate one small misunderstanding, when I said we need to empower individuals, uh, that's not opposed to regulating, yeah. quite the opposite. You know, we need to regulate, to legislate in order to, uh, to empower the individual. But then the, the, the question, I'm going to put the question to you and let you think about it a little bit and then I'll come back. Because you said uh, the, the television, uh, the, the media landscape is already well regulated. We have a long tradition. Uh, we see more regulation now on the internet, but it can be used in both directions. We also know that there are governments of EU member states who are actually using regulation to silence critical voices and opposition parties. So they're not actually empowering citizens or enhancing democracy. They're using regulation to do exactly the opposite. And is Europe doing enough to, to, to stop that and to make sure that regulation is value-driven and that it's liberal values and not illiberal values that are, are driving regulation. I think that is what we need to... And that's why I said at the start, we're not regulating technology. We're regulating on the basis of our values, which is not the same. But I'll, I'll come back to you first, Luther. Sure. I, I think um, in the sort of interplay between competition and regulation that... Um, Competition law enforcement is the antidote to regulation. That if you don't enforce the competition laws, then you have to regulate. It, you do, uh, if, if a online platform does get big enough, it does become a juicy target for bad actors to uh, mess with society in a, in a massive way. And so by, uh, you know, oxygenating markets, by creating a... Um, uh, more competition, you create more pluralism, you create uh, more opportunities for uh, startups to enter and uh, attract consumers maybe because they're providing the best privacy protections or they're uh, doing the best to ensure that their data is um, not being used in ways that might be unsavory. But today the con consumers just don't have that many choices online and that's I think a, a big part of the problem. Yeah, thank you. I think we have a fantastic commissioner, uh, commissioner Margarete Vestager, who is who's tackling exactly that because the European Parliament's always been very critical of the fact that the Commission has been very slow to to <coughs> understand the fact that competition rules are key to you know to keeping the internet uh, uh, savory but and, and can clean. Can I say and one thing on that? Is that I think the trial is the remedy. So, you know, th what we saw in DOJ versus Microsoft, if you look, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the, the mere act of bringing an enforcement action has an oxygenating effect and, and can create these problems. I mean, you look at uh, Google today, I mean, they are, uh, uh, you know, th they're somewhat paralyzed. And, and so I think that this creates uh, e even the mere act, where however it ultimately uh, ends up in an appeal, can actually uh, create positive effects for consumers. Get them moving. Philip, you're both Secretary of State for Privacy Protection, but you also have a background in, um, in the Economic Affairs Committee in the European Parliament. 
What's your take on this? Maybe go back to basics for once. Um, what I see also is that we are at the dawn of, of really the implementation, not only from the side of technology, but also the use of this technology, which really reshapes the fundamentals of our society. And I, for example, think that our educational system is completely unaware of this. Um, I have a three-year-old uh, daughter, um, and uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, education she will go through in kindergarten for the next three years, while you see all these kind of evolutions around you. So I'm pretty sure that at this moment, we are not really helping our, our youngsters to really cope with the complexity of what's heading their way. Um, to stay into the, the comparison with television, I mean, the content which we, saw, which we saw on television was generated by in a single place often. Now, the content of what we see is generated all across the globe. So how are you going to regulate that? How are you going to contain that? How are you going to pinpoint that? I mean, and the only way for me to do or to start to do that is really to empower young people to understand the dynamics behind all of this. And when it comes to competition, yes, I'm a true believer in free markets and competition, and, and I think that we need more competition, especially also from European companies, but that's a separate debate. But in the end, we also understand that many of these platform technologies economically are driven towards network effects, which means that to, they, they go and evolve towards even faster than old industries into natural monopolies. So I think there is also a, a reason why Vestager and others should really take a look at this and to see how, because it's natural behavior that people want to go to the location, to the platform, which already is accumulating the most con consumers and the most uh, data and the most uh, exchangeable formats. And so this is, these are all elements today, I think, where we only are scratching the surface and we're really looking at this and we see all this happening, but we didn't figure out how to put this puzzle together. So I think the three elements that we are discussing here are crucial, but we're still really at the surface because we don't know how to reshape our educational system to really empower our kids to deal with a complex economy in a digital era. We are not really sure on how to regulate on competition to make sure that we mitigate some of the network effects which drive people clumping them together in kind of a monopolistic situation and keep diversity and tolerance alive. So I think these are all fundamental debates that we are, we are still only scratching the surface of. And the final comment that I would like to make is also that we are, if we want to regulate, we are going to touch on some fundamental freedoms. We are going to have to have a debate about freedom of speech we, because there I think that we are really often missing the cue. Starting to regulate, and I agree with you, Sophie, but when I see people and today governments, um, let's name them, eh, like in Hungary, like in Poland, starting to regulate because of the freedom of speech is, an, is a danger to their society, it's often liberal voices which are silenced, not the liberal ones, on the contrary. Um, when I see, for example, debates on, on uh, how to contain, even in, in the most toughest ways, uh, everything that is, is around the, the terrible terrorist attacks that we have seen in Europe, also there, stopping people to say what they think will not stop them acting on what they're thinking. And so also there, I think we have to have a fundamental debate on how we as liberals continue to defend the freedom of speech, continue to defend the fact that people are able to make choices, but also I think it's crucial for every member party here present to really start focusing on education to see how we can reform our educational system because there will be no rule, there will be no competition which will outperform the fact that we are enabling our youth to understand what's going on and to see before their eyes and act on it on how they should deal and work in this new digital economy. Thank you. Um, just one question. Something that always strikes me is that um, we, we tend to, well, uh, apart from events like, like this, but let's say uh, generally in, in national politics, there's actually, there may be uh, debates on the ethics of the digital area in, in a national parliament, but then we legislate at European level. And there, there's actually hardly any uh, European political debate about the ethics. Then we only talk about technology. Uh, we talk about legislation and, and, and how, to, how to enable uh, uh, technological development, but a real ethical debate. I mean, I, have, I, you know, I don't know what's going on behind closed doors, but I've rarely actually seen, for example, a prime minister making a press conference after a council summit and saying, you know, we had a really profound debate about the ethical dimension of the digital era. It's usually about material things. How do you see this? There, there is this funny discrepancy between having, uh, you know, the debate on ethics at national level, but then regulating at European level, and then all of a sudden this ethical debate is not there anymore. How are we going to overcome that? Questions from the floor. Yes, that's okay. But I'm first going to ask Philippe to answer this question. 
No, I, I agree that we have to have also an ethical debate because, like I said, I think that this digital economy is really transforming how our societies are, are functioning. Um, in my opinion, for the better. I think I'm still a, a, an optimist about the progress that we are seeing. But I think that we have to do much more also in that, uh, in that sense to, to defend and to fight for our core values. I often feel that we as liberals, when we are confronted by conservatives who only have a security agenda or by um, uh, left-wing parties who say, yeah, but basically anything goes and, and this kind of cultural uh, relativism, I think we have to really stand up at that moment for our core values, which is individual rights individual freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, equality between men and women, those are the core values, neutrality of government also. I mean, in a very diverse society, my opinion is that you need a very clear, principle-based government, which is also defending the core values of liberal democracy. It's called liberal democracy for a reason. And it's not just uh, about the elections, it's really about defending the institutions and the principles on which these institutions are based. And I think that the fundamental debate also that, that our generation of politicians will have to have is about this, and is about how we're going to also rethink government in order to enable government to much more do uh, to, to defend these this core values. And I think that's, that's indeed a, a debate, and it's something where I, when I have debates in my own city, in my own country, I often start by saying that. I often start by laying out why we are having this discussion, what is at stake, why fundamental liberal rights are really contributing to enabling diversity, enabling tolerance, enabling a diverse society to come about. I mean, there will be no diversity in our society without tolerance and individual freedom. And coming back to those core values, there's only one party, there's only one group of people who can defend that with any credibility throughout history, and that's liberals. I fully agree. Okay, I can take some questions from uh, the audience. I don't see very much, though. I see a gentleman over there at the microphone. Hello. Right. Um, my name is uh, Dinesh Damija. I'm the deputy treasurer of the uh, Liberal Democrats in the UK. And uh, in my previous guise, I was the founder of ebookers.com, which was the first internet travel company right across Europe. So. My, uh, I've got a couple of points to make. Uh, yes, but can, can, you, can you keep them concise? Then I will. We get an answer from uh, the panel. The f first is a warning that do not stifle innovation because R&D in tech innovation is the only competitive advantage. That's the only thing now left. There are 16 acorns, which means Companies that started within a year in Europe that have got to a valuation of $1 billion in Europe. I agree there are 45 in the US, but there are 16 here. I'd like to know if the panel knows any of them. The third thing, our laws have to be on a level playing field with the rest of the world. We put in laws here, we're going to be at a competitive disadvantage unless we talk to the US. And I'm afraid the U.S. was sleeping during the Russian attacks on the Internet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I see uh, two people at the mic over there and another gentleman over there. I'm going to take your questions and then come back to the panel. I see a lady with a red jacket. Yeah, uh, my name is Astrid Thors. I am on vice president on the LI Bureau and also on the LI uh, Human Rights Committee. I want to take up th a thread that I think you, Sophie, put. Uh, when we are looking and we are talking that we are want to have same rules online as offline, or offline as on, other way around, anyway. But for instance, the German example, uh, where companies, according to the code of conduct, is able to take down material without the legal procedure, we are in other cases uh, uh, requiring for such actions. I don't think it really is in the right way are giving much of the power into the hands of the multinationals. Today, we know they are American, but as you, Sophie said, they might, be, uh, they might be Chinese, and we know how these measures are also taken in some other countries where nationalism, where extremism is used very, very broadly. So I would, I would little bit ask a little bit of a caution, and Sophie, to you, the survey research that the European Parliament sponsored on surveillance technologies has been very useful and you should continue implementing it. Just from the floor, one comment. Thank you very much for that research. 
Thank you. We're doing our best. And sorry, I didn't recognize you against the light. Good morning, Astrid. <laughs> the gentleman over there. Thank you very much, uh, John Innes, Liberal Democrats uh, UK. I wanted to, some people will refer to the fact that the digital age has led to blurring of national boundaries. And I think it was David Wilden mentioned about tax. So I'd like to bring up the whole issue of tax. In a digital age, we have high levels of property rights. We have the ability to evade taxes, relocate things. We have issue of even evasion of VAT. What are we doing about that? Are we actually trying to tax the wrong things? How can we bring a level and fair playing field about? Thank you very much. And the, the last question, uh, that gentleman over there. Yeah, hello, uh, Sven Gosler, FDP, Germany. I had um, two main things to remark, and these are sort of questions. One is on the de facto monopolies um, platforms and specific internet companies uh, are representing, meanwhile. Um, to me, and that's also to Sky, by the way, um, <clears throat> to me it represents um, a sort of power that we need to balance against the consumer um, so that consumer protection would allow uh, to reduce that power by, you know, collecting a lot of people doing the same thing. So if Facebook contains or, or is, is using 5 billion or has 5 billion users, I'm not sure what the exact, exact number at the moment is, how can we make sure that this is not misused by the platform? And the second issue I would like to tackle is what, what you said, um, that um, we pay with cash in the real life. We pay with information in the digital life. So how do we balance, or how do we make that information cash-worthy? Meaning, um, how, can we create some kind of, um, how do you say, um, uh, tool that allows us to, re to withdraw our cash uh, from the internet, meaning to withdraw information uh, that we provided from the internet? I'd like to hear some opinions on that. I think that's a very, a very topical question about the economic value of personal data. I'm going to invite the panel from left to right, starting with Vera, to uh, respond to some or all of the questions that were put. Yeah, I will start with withdrawing the cash. Uh, <coughs> this is topical because <laughs> we have proposed uh, the directive on contractual rules for online uh, sales of digital content, where the people in Europe are uh, 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 kept uh, under the conviction that they get something for free. They get something for their personal data, which is the currency uh, of, of digital sphere. So uh, the Commission proposed uh, uh, this uh, directive including uh, the right to withdraw this cash uh, in case uh, uh, the contract lasts too long and, and the consumer is not satisfied or something gets wrong. The people uh, should have uh, guaranteed the right to uh, ask the provider not to use the data anymore and to some kind of bring, bring the data back, if I understood well, well the question. Uh, some other questions were for, for, the, for the commercial <laughs> sphere. So on the taxes, well, it's, it's uh, not maybe the question for me, but the uh, uh, Commission is considering some uh, special taxation of, of, of digital. Uh, for, for good purposes, I saw some impact assessment which shows that uh, we need to do something about that, but I cannot go into details on the um, uh, takedowns and uh, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, I will connect it with the reaction on what the minister said before and what Sophie said before. Well, I, I think that uh, we must leave internet free and not to try to micromanage this world through legislation. But on the other hand, we have to be absolutely clear what basic core values must be upheld there and kept. And uh, I, I must say, when we, when we worked on this uh, code of conduct, uh, uh, which means that the companies are taking down the, the hate speech uh, within some time limit, uh, it was very clear that freedom of expression is, is given by default. This is the basic situation. Everything must stay untouched, unless it is something which is prohibited by the law. And 
I can tell you when I uh, presented this, I was criticized as the EU censor and uh, you are, uh, you should read Orwell, uh, what are you creating in Europe? And I, I must say I was some, my, myself hesitant uh, whether we are doing the proper thing. And then I went to Austria and there was a young lady, a journalist, very well educated young lady. And she asked me, what about that taking down the, the hate speech from online? Uh, aren't you censoring? And now listen, it may be not right to call for killing others, but shouldn't we uh, uh, keep the protection over this as well because this is the freedom of expression? And I shouted on her, no, because this is the basic <coughs> thing. This, this must be not only prohibited, but also unacceptable to call for killing. How come that after the Second World War, everybody knew that? This was the period of, of the values which were absolutely clear. Over the time, we created institutions, uh, procedures, we relativized everything, including these core values. And now we have to insist that the, they will be present and upholded in, in Internet. All the other things should be led for free development. I will be the last one who will want to micromanage the internet. The, the philosophers now speak about internet as the uh, natural state, which uh, will only develop its own rules. Maybe in the future there will be own rules, and I would refer you to uh, the conflict between uh, uh, Hobbes and Rousseau. Is it Leviathan, uh, which needs imposed uh, rules, or is it Rousseau's uh, social agreement where everybody must agree on, 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 the, on the rules? I think we are at this crossroad. Before we have the answer on this, we will try to say, these are the rules from, off from offline, which should be applied online. And these are the basic things which must be kept there. Otherwise, we will go to some kind of catastrophe. Thank you very much. David. Sophie, it, it's fantastic to come to a liberal congress because it is the place where values are talked about. And I, I appreciate that that's your core value, if you like. It matters. European values do matter. And I think this is actually ultimately what this debate is about. Um, it's also very good to hear some British voices from Liberal Democrats, so I'm obviously not alone. It's nice to, it's the party I started my career in 25 years ago, so it's good to, good to hear from you. And you, you made an interesting point, sir, about um, innovation. Yes, innovation is all we have, but let me tell you, when you're competing against some of these monoliths, innovation is tough. In the advertising world, we're all trying to innovate but we're competing for people, and we're competing for resources, and we're competing against companies that, frankly, are almost impossible to stand up to. <laughs> and actually, very often, those, those innovations, those innovative new startups, when they get you know, noticed, they get gobbled up by these cash-rich companies. And, and I, I think that is a big problem, and it goes to Luther's core point about competition, which, um, is absolutely right, and, and the last question from the, from, from the floor about consumer power. Competition is key here. Um, and, you know, if, if, if we only judge competition in the way that it has been done, certainly stateside, for too long, on the basis of immediate consumer welfare and prices, we're allowing these monopolies, these natural monopolies, to grow and grow. And I think there has to be some really big questions about what competition means in the digital age now. Um, if we're going to ensure that consumer power really does mean something um, in a networked uh, environment. Um, taxes, look, we pay two billion of euros of taxes last year across Europe. Um, how do we compete when our rivals aren't, you know, aren't employing people, aren't paying taxes? As I said in my, in my speech, if that's a competitive disadvantage, you've got a real problem. And then finally, I, I understand the concerns about the German platform law, but put it this way, these companies are already making decisions about taking down content, filtering content, editing content. They are already making those decisions. 
what is better? There is democratic oversight, or essentially they have a free-for-all to do as they please. I, I, I believe that we have to get the democratic oversight correct in this debate, and that's what I'm trying to do is to, to say that, you know, there is a sector where this has been going on a long time. There are some lessons we can learn which don't impinge on free speech and do create a safer world. Thank you. Loser? I think that's a, that's a great point uh, that these companies, uh, certain companies have gotten so big that they've effectively become, th they are the private governments. They are the regulators of this information and, um, and you know, not to sound like a broken record, but I think uh, you know competition is the is what what how we remedy it. And I, I appreciate the gentleman's point about taxes because I think that's another dimension of how these uh, companies advantage themselves uh, unfairly. Um, another way they advantage unfairly, which I think ties into both competition and the ethics point you brought up, is that you know the the. Silicon Valley uses behavioral, experiment-based behavioral economics to design its products and establish monopolies. It then uses neoclassical economics to defend its monopolies. So if you, uh, you know, you've, we've, we've all heard the phrase, competition is a click away. And you know, that's a phrase that uh, suggests we're all rational actors in free markets, and if we don't like what our search results see, we can, we can go to bing.com. But the truth is, is that, and, and Google's own economists have, have sort of admitted this, is that if you don't find what you're looking for in Google, you're, uh, you, you're more likely to just give up and abandon your search than you are to move a few pixels up and type in bing.com or duckduckgo.com. Um, and so that suggests that rational actor theory is not a very good tool for understanding what's really going on and that there is a cognitive cost uh, to switching. And this is another uh, issue about sort of, th this ties into the ethics, is that these firms are exploiting uh, behavioral economics to maximize lock-in to, it's not, because it's not just the network effects, it's the network effects combined with this sort of unethical product design, which, where these are basically, we need to think about these products, especially the social networks, like, uh, like cigarettes and alcohol, and, and, and um, as highly addictive substances. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, look up Tristan Harris, uh, who's uh, been speaking a lot about this. He's Google's former design ethicist, who's been just, traversing the globe, sounding the alarm about uh, how these products are designed to maximate, uh, maximize uh, and habituate uh, users. And, and so until you address the, that kind of lock-in, I don't think in, uh, you can really ease uh, a lot of these problems. And so, um, yeah, I think these are all wonderful comments. Thank you, Philippe. Um, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, the, the previous comment leads me to, um, to think that we maybe should read a little bit less of Hobbes and Rousseau and maybe a little bit more of Hayek and the Austrian economics because they actually combined already um, a liberal free market uh, view also with behavioral economics. And I think also we should try to read up because I think they understood best how markets work and how today some of these companies are using those market dynamics. Um, the second point that I wanted to make is Yes, um, taxation might be part of that equation, I mean, like, like the previous speaker said, but I think that also as politicians we have to rethink on what we are taxating. We are taxing labor, we are taxing property, we are taxing um, some things that we find harmful in society, and we have to really truly make a shift also in taxation because the digital economy will function in a completely different way. Maybe we continue with taxation what is harmful, CO2 and other things, but we also have to rethink on what we are taxing when it comes to the digital economy. And then I think we should look at, for example, much more to transactions. Um, we are not going to be able to tax property anymore because everybody, uh, everybody will put their car and everything else in the sharing economy model. So what, are you going, what kind of property are you going to tax? So also there we're just scratching the surface because we only understand now, start to understand how this will change the economy. And the last point that I would like to make is on innovation. Yes, innovation is crucial. We are still at the forefront of innovation in Europe. We often um, look at, at what's going on in the US or in China, but we're still at our, our universities and even our companies, even startup companies are still very, very innovative. What we are lacking, in my opinion, is really the current infrastructure in the marketplace 
to sustain those companies, to make those companies grow. And the reason is actually quite simple. We have 28 different capital markets. We have not an integrated capital market. And this is crucial to make companies grow because initially they need maybe 100,000 euros to start, they need 500,000 euros to grow, and then they need 10 million to conquer the world. And we cannot provide in the European capital markets today for, two, uh, for all these companies those 10 million. And I think that's a crucial aspect of also developing your own economy that you make sure that your rules also for the bank and the financial sector are strict to protect, but at the same time also allow these continuous investment. And I think therefore the question came from somebody from the UK, Brexit is going to be a crucial loss and we're going to have to restate that capacity in the continent to see how we can sustain and fund those new companies. Well, so you, you, I made a remark about the, the title of today's uh, session before you, you came in. I said, why do we call it the future of European internet policy? Well, we're talking about uh, American tech giants the whole time. And the, the point is not just 28 capital markets. The point is, and again, we should break, not be afraid to break a taboo, even as liberals, uh, there are also 28 fiscal barriers. Uh, and, and that is, you know, you, you cannot operate, you cannot compete in the digital era if you have 28 national markets which are, are, are sealed off by fiscal and regulatory barriers. Can we please, as liberals, talk about that sometimes? Because I know that also within our liberal family, their parties are saying, no, that's a taboo, no-go area, fine. But then we should also accept that, you know, yes, we will be ruled by American companies. And I love America, I think it's a great country. Uh, but, you know, we, this is also about democracy. And the question about taxation, um, uh, I think because taxation is not just about revenues, it's also about, uh, you know, giving incentives to, to, to behavior that you, that you want. Um, and I was thinking, you know, why don't we, because everybody's always talking about free services to the consumer when everybody knows they're not free. Vera has already said it. We're paying with our personal data. And there is just no limit, there is no disincentive to the, to the collection of personal data and the use of personal data because it's for free for the companies and for governments because they actually get the personal data from, from the companies. Now, what if we actually tax the use of personal data? Not just the profit of the companies at the end, but you know, put a tax on the use of personal data. That will, be, uh, that will make them think twice. You know, and then they will, will, will focus on the actual valuable use of personal data and it will also make governments think twice before they, uh, they, they adopt new mass surveillance laws. Okay, we have two more, three more questions. Very, very quickly and then I'm going to ask uh, for the closing uh, remarks of the panelists because I have no watch but I'm pretty sure that we are out of time already. 11.45. Oh, then we've overrun by 15 minutes already. Good. Already. Uh, I'm going to take the few questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. The gentleman I'll, and lady. I'll try to keep it short. Um, we didn't really talk about the fact that the companies uh, um, uh, should realize that they can kill their own market by the way they're dealing right now with internet and their consumers. Um, last, uh, last example is manipulating machinery over the internet, the machinery at home, uh, where one can put a blockage on the machinery in the hope that you can buy a new one. And, and there I go, uh, what about manipulation? What freedom of mani uh, manipulation one can offer to okay. company life? Okay, that's, that's a, cl a clear question. Quickly to the gentleman over there, because we're really... Almost Just uh, one remark, uh, Libu Jabata from the Democratic Party of Malta. We haven't mentioned one word uh, directly, algorithms. The big um, websites use algorithms constantly and, and using the data we are freely and consciously giving them to present us what that we want to see. Facebook is a master of this. Now I'd like to know if there's any um, power from the European politician leaders oh, that we said limits, lines, yeah. red lines that yeah. um, these big web giants cannot exceed because okay. algorithms okay. are the, programmed the by The question is, is clear, sorry. Last question. Yes, hello, Barrett Roots from Germany. I'm sorry, I have to follow up on my colleague's question. Um, you know, as Germans have lots of data concerns. I was speaking to the representative of Facebook uh, yesterday here, actually, and she made a valid point. Um, you say, isn't it better for democratic oversight instead of letting companies decide on uh, what is hate speech 
and uh, every company having their own rules. But um, now Facebook is put in a position that they have to decide on a daily basis within 24 hours uh, what, uh, what is within the German rule of law and uh, what is hateful speech, what goes against um, groups and promotes violence against groups. Mm -hmm. And this is something that in a German court would take weeks and weeks to process because we have an independence between uh, le legislation, oh. executive, okay. and okay. the jurisdiction. So I don't see yeah. how that is actually democratic oversight. Okay. Question is clear. Incidentally, I think there are some crocodile tears of Facebook there because they, you know, without blinking, take down a site of transgender people uh, saying that it's offensive. But uh, when it's about hate speech, they go like, oh, we really can't tell if it's hate speech or not. Okay. I will be quick very closing quick, remarks uh, on the first question on manipulation. Uh, trust is of the essence for for the IT uh, sector. So they, everybody will tell you that, and if they uh, disappoint the trust of people, and if the uh, market surveillance bodies will find this out, they will have a chance to sanction them properly in the EU. So I think we are in, a, in a, on a good way to discipline. Uh, them uh, very quickly through G GDPR. Uh, on the algorithms, yes, we have the debate with, with all IT big ones. Uh, they promised to me that if the conversation starts to go to the extremist uh, position, uh, they, they can uh, take uh, uh, technological arrangements to lead to such discussion to, to nowhere very quickly. Yeah, so, so this is clear. The second thing on algorithm, if the people will uh, have uh, in services uh, uh, sphere, if they will have a suspicion that uh, the algorithm, algorithm caused some discrimination, they will have the right to ask how the selection was made because there should be no bias in, in, in these uh, principles. I must be very quick. Uh, again, to hate speech in Germany, well, we, what we, I know the German law, what we want uh, them to do is to do it on a daily basis, to invest in people in do, uh, doing that every, every day in all the EU member states, understanding the language, the national law, and the decisions of the, of the constitutional courts, on what is and what is not a, uh, a prohibited hate speech, because it's very important that they understand this distinction. Uh, they uh, sh must invest in it. Somebody clever said that if you uh, make one billion dollars, you must make sure that you do something good for one billion people. And I think that this is what we want them to do, simply to invest uh, in, in Europe into this. I spoke to people who do this on an everyday basis uh, in Facebook in Dublin. Believe me, uh, to work uh, eight hours a day uh, with such dirt, which the people produce, it's horrible. The people burn out after three months of doing that, by the way. On trans uh, uh, last comment on, on this. Uh, we push now the, com the IT companies to increase transparency so that those who notify hate speech get the feedback whether it was deleted or not. And I think also this also will contribute to cultivation of, of this space and also for, as a feedback for the companies whether they took the right decision or not. If somebody will, uh, will, be, uh, will feel himself or herself uh, uh, somehow uh, mm, mm, uh, cheated by them or, or uh, they will see that there was not the right treatment, they always have a chance to go to the, co to the court and to, to uh, have the procedure. Okay, thank you. David? Very quickly, because I know everybody's hungry. Um, I think one of the things that links all this together actually is your final point, Commissioner, which is transparency. You know, if we're worried about the algorithms, let's know more about them. Let's understand them more uh, and the decisions that the platforms are making. If we're worried about what they're doing and under German law, let's have some transparency about all of that. I think, I think you know, traditional media has to be more transparent. New media is less transparent, and that is one of the key things. It's the best disinfectant, remember. Um, uh, the final point I would make uh, is let's all be very careful because you know, we see the cycle of these things. These big companies... I wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear in the not-too-distant future them asking for more regulation because it can often cement market power <laughs> and we have to be very careful about that. So let's watch for the cycle as it goes around. <coughs> Thank you. Luther? 
Uh, I know we're out of time, so I'll just make it very quick. Thank you again for uh, the time. And I just, again, sort of thank the leadership of uh, Commissioner Vestager and uh, and the European Commission right now is is really protecting the internet and leading the way on in many fronts. And uh, I think the the United States is starting to realize that the train has left the station and, and it is behind. And, and all of these issues, I, th I predict next year, particularly in the competition realm, uh, we're going to see sort of uh, attempts to catch up because uh, there is now a sense uh, within the state attorneys general in the United States that European consumers are poised to enjoy better protections than U.S. consumers. And so I think that's just a testament to the leadership of Europe. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, maybe a final comment on the last questions. Um, the underlying um, tone of those questions is, this, is uh, that you suppose that many of these decisions are still human-based. They will not be <laughs> any more human-based uh, 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 decisions being made. I think there you, you need, uh, you will see much more artificial intelligence, for example, popping up. And then, indeed, transparency is key. Enforcement will be key of the rules. But also, and this is, this is really my, my baseline I started out with also, is that you need to empower people that they understand what exactly they are doing, how their data is being treated, how they operate into a new digital economy. And I think this starts with really uh, investing in our educational system, which today is not helping young people to cope with these new challenges. Thank you very much. Then I would like to uh, to thank all the panelists for their uh, very, very inspiring input into this debate. I would also like to thank the audience. Uh, those, I mean, uh, quite a few people have left because I think they, uh, they wanted lunch. Uh, but the real diehards are still here. So I would like to thank you and in particular those who put in the questions. And please give a big hand to the panelists.